I absolutely, I'm super thankful for the opportunity to preach this morning. Absolutely love being a part of this church, uh, and I'm really looking forward. It's been nice to be back these last however many weeks, six weeks or so. Uh, I'm super excited, Lord willing, when everyone will be able to be back here on a Sunday morning worshiping together again. I can't wait for that to happen. That being said, for those of us who are here together in the building this morning, I have a little impromptu poll question that I run, wanted to run by you all. Um, now, here's the thing. I anticipated this going one way, but I asked somebody else this question earlier this week and didn't get the answer that I was necessarily expecting. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, raise your hand if you have heard the uh, public service announcement slogan, only you can prevent forest fires. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that's kind of what I was expecting. Yes, not super surprising. Turns out that is the longest running public service announcement campaign in the United States history. Uh, dating all the way back to, uh, I think, World War II. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible the things you can learn when you're studying for a sermon. It's, it's unbelievable. Speaking of which, I also learned that the mascot who says that slogan, only you can prevent forest fires, apparently his name is Smokey Bear, not Smokey the Bear, which I'm still reeling from learning that. I mean, it's blowing me away. So take some time, let that sink in. Okay, so... Obviously, doing some research on forest fires and wildfires this week, and um, I learned, this brought me to California. I learned that apparently California, unfortunately, has a lot of wildfires. And I also learned that uh, apparently 2018 was the worst wildfire uh, season on history for the state. So I got some statistics from California 2018 wildfire season that I wanted to share with you. Uh, in 2018 alone, California had over 8,500 fires which burned almost 2 million acres. They destroyed over 22,000 buildings and took the lives of over 100 people. The cost of these fires was well over $3.5 billion. That's just one state in one year, which is just crazy. Basically, what I learned was, to summarize, uh, wildfires, forest fires are insanely destructive and expensive. So having said that, I want to shift gears a little bit and share a different story with you. And at first, it's probably going to sound totally unrelated, but just stick with me. They connect, you'll see, and it'll all make sense, hopefully. Okay, some of you, you may or may not have heard the story, may remember about a woman back in 2013 named Justine. I'm not positive how to pronounce her last name. I think it's Sacco. To give you a little idea of where this story is going, I read about this story in an article in the New York Times titled, how one stupid text blew up Justine Sacco's life. So here's the story. Apparently she was traveling from America to Africa to visit family back in like 2012, 2013, something like that. And so it's a long trip, so she was, had layovers in different countries along the way. And so apparently when she would land in a different country, she'd hop on her phone, open up Twitter, and just post a comment really unkind about how she, her perspective on how people in other countries were living. Super unkind. Um, but not a lot of people noticed because she only had like 100, 150 followers on Twitter. So not like a huge deal, but not very kind. However, it was her final tweet that changed everything for her, and it changed it fast. So apparently the last leg of her journey was 11 hours long, and before she got on that plane to fall asleep, she thought it would be a good idea to post the following. Well... I'll paraphrase. She got on Twitter and posted, hey, headed into Africa, so glad that I won't get, be getting AIDS because I have the right color of skin. Turns her phone off, gets on the plane and falls asleep for 11 hours. And I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what was going through her head when she said that. Um, but at the very least, I can say that was super hurtful, insensitive, unloving, just foolish thing to say. I wasn't even sure, honestly, I, was, I went back and forth, like, should I even share this? Like, it's, it's super cruel. I understand that. So as she posts this, falls asleep, and she makes her 11-hour flight with her phone turned off, this single sentence somehow managed to get picked up by thousands of people and started getting shared all over the world. Uh, and it eventually ended up becoming the number one trending topic on Twitter for that day. Uh, and people started, like, doing other hashtags with it, like, hey, fire Justine Sacco. Hey, like, has she landed yet? Hey, like, all kinds of stuff, as you can imagine. So by the time she lands, it's an 11-hour flight, lands, this is all unknown to her, turns on her phone, 
Needless to say, she received quite the shock when she gets a flood of emails and text messages from people all over, letting her know that she had lost her job, she had been fired. Ironically, somewhat, she worked for a public relations firm, so you would think even that alone would have like clued her in. Uh, lost several former friends because, I mean, come on now. Uh, second, she, or third, she quite possibly became the most hated person on the planet, began receiving several death threats, and finally realized she was not going to be able to go out in public safely for a long time. Now, having said that, there's, you know, I would understand if you're sitting out there this morning thinking, you know what, she was getting what she deserved. And frankly, you could be right. I don't know. Maybe that's a conversation for a different time. The point I wanted us to see is that with just that one sentence, in a very short amount of time, she managed to destroy her life and her reputation, not to mention hurting countless others around the globe. In a very real sense, you could say that her words were like a spark that started a forest fire in her life, destroying everything around her. So in our Bibles, in the book of James, in chapter 3, it says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Which, those are some pretty strong words. That's a pretty strong warning. This morning, that's where we're going to be. That's the text we're going to be in, is the first half of James chapter 3. And in case that line I just quoted didn't clue you in, he has some pretty strong words to share for us on thoughts of share, uh, being cautious and how we use our words. Now, because I'm fairly confident that no one here this morning has probably done quite what Justine did back then. You're probably thinking, I would never do something like that. And I would agree with you, you probably wouldn't. But I would also say this, I would imagine if I was to tell you that I had a recording of every word that you've said over the last, I don't know, week, three weeks, month, and I was going to play it over the loudspeakers this morning for everybody to hear, chances are you wouldn't feel super comfortable with that. Just, just guessing. I wouldn't feel super comfortable with that. I'll show you that. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Because we know that we all say things in the spur of the moment, oftentimes, or even premeditated, say things that are super cruel, unkind, unloving, and foolish. And we wish, sometimes immediately, oh, I wish I could take that back, but we can't. We all use our words in ways that are careless and destructive. So this morning, we are going to turn to God's Word to hear what He has to say to us about how we are to use our speech. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump into our text. God, we look to You. God, we come to You in the name of Jesus, and we just... We invite you here this morning. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit this morning and that as your word goes out, Spirit, we pray that you would move and work in our hearts, in our minds. We pray that you would do your God thing, bring conviction of sin, bring encouragement, bring hope, bring new life. You bring dead hearts to life. We pray that you would bring salvation this morning. We pray that you would turn lives around. We pray that above all, Jesus, you would be lifted very high. We love you so much, and we pray that you would be honored this morning. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So again, we're going to be in James chapter 3, and we're going to be, it'll be the first 12 verses. <clears throat> Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. 
Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Okay, to give you an idea, a framework of uh, where this sermon's going to go this morning, I can summarize my message for you in one sentence uh, like this. Life is hard. God is good. Tell the world. Now, I will tell you this, uh, as I look at the text I just read there in James, that's probably not exactly how I would summarize what James just said to us there right off the bat. However, as I was studying this and kind of preparing what I wanted to say, I realized that the only way that we can really understand what it is that James is trying to say to us in chapter 3 is as we pan back and see how his instruction in chapter 3 fits in with uh, all of his instruction in the rest of his letter and specifically fits in with uh, how he's communicating the gospel message in the rest of his letter. So stick with me, and we'll dive into this text and also other places in James, and hopefully it's all going to tie together, and you'll see how this works, and it'll be a blessing for all of us. So let's get into the first point, which, as I said, is life is hard. You see, James wrote this letter to a group of people who seem to be going through a lot of stuff. A lot of hard, stressful, I'm sure, circumstances. You don't even get like a paragraph into this letter before he's, automa- he's already encouraging his audience. Hey, take heart, count it all, consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. He's, I mean, he gets right to it. Obviously, they're going through something, right? And then through the, rest of the letter, through the rest of this letter, we see James addressing all sorts of relational strife that seems to be going on. We see stuff like the rich people oppressing the poor people. We see some people in the church being neglected while other people in the church are apparently getting like preferential treatment. Uh, he mentions arguments and fighting, not that we have any of that. Uh, we see people being mistreated at their work and just generally super unpleasant circumstances. And so I bring that up just to ask, think about yourself. Um, I can't imagine, has anyone here gone through maybe some stress lately, maybe some unprecedented circumstances that have brought on some pressure and stress, maybe like the last three or six months, I I don't know what they would be, but, or maybe like has the whole world felt like maybe it's in a pressure cooker and it's getting ready to like explode at any minute, or maybe it's already started to explode a little bit. So what? Life is hard. Why is that important as it relates to James chapter 3 and working on taming our tongue? I think it's important to have this context for this, what he's instructing us, because we all know and can relate to the fact that when we're going through stuff, when we're going through hard things, and life is not going our way, and we're feeling a lot of pressure and everything, that stress and that pressure have a way of squeezing us and bringing what's on the inside, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, bringing that up to the surface and out. And a lot of times... What's coming out, what's being squeezed out by our circumstances isn't super pretty. It's stuff that we would kind of like to keep hidden from the rest of the world, maybe even hidden from ourselves. Um, So it's coming out, and the quickest way that it comes out is through our speech, obviously. And James is warning us here in chapter 3, and he's using the strongest language possible. I mean, look at the text, look at what he's saying. There's no stronger warning. To tell us that in all times, but especially when times are hard, and you're going through rough stuff, we need to be very careful not to just let every thought that crosses our mind come spilling out of our mouths. We need to keep a tight rein on our tongues. But why is that? We see that he gives us two things that will happen if we just let things come out of our mouths. First, our words, he says, will spread like a poison or a fire, destroying everything and everyone around us. And second, he says that Our words will actually take hold of our own lives like the bit in the mouth of a horse or a rudder on a ship and will begin to steer our lives onto a path of destruction. Now that first consequence that he mentions there shouldn't probably come as any surprise to any of us. The fact that careless words will wound and hurt those around us. I mean, we've all witnessed that. We've all seen consequences of careless and thoughtless words coming out and then burning like a fire around us, destroying relationships and destroying reputations and just bringing destruction. I'm sure you've probably at least heard stories of the terrible power of words. Of, there are stories of 
bullies at school that are just relentlessly teasing and picking on the students around them to the other student just can't take it anymore. And you hear these horrible stories of kids, young kids sometimes, taking their own lives because they just can't take these words anymore. Our words can kill. We've seen the power of our words to destroy psychologically. You probably know somebody or maybe you yourself are someone who has heard from a parent that you're no good, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to rid yourself of the self-doubt that those words of poison planted in your soul. We know all too well we're familiar with how our words destroy others. So that wasn't like super surprising to me, although it was, you know, encouraging or instructive. But the second part there that he mentioned, the fact that our words have a way of steering us like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder on a ship, that to me, that was surprising to me. I was kind of surprised as I was digging in here and I was like, I wasn't quite sure how that worked. Um, And so because uh, we've learned from Jesus and the book of Proverbs that our words flow out of our hearts. We pro- you know, if you spend any time in church, you've probably heard that, that what you say comes out of your hearts. So my thought is, this means that our hearts are what is directing our course, like all the time. And that is true. Our hearts direct our course. But James here in chapter 3 seems to be going out of his way to emphasize that our speech also has the ability to direct our course. So I was trying to figure out how do these two things go together. And I found some instruction and some good help understanding this in a commentary from pastor and author Tim Keller. He explains that, yes, our hearts do impact our words, but at the same time, our words impact our hearts. The influence goes both ways. And he says, Keller says the influence happens like this, quote, Our words embody and strengthen our thoughts. When you say something like, I hate you, I wish you were dead, you say it because you felt it. But afterward, you feel it more because you said it. What we say has a way of filling our hearts. This means, and I want us to think about this, whenever we're going through something, at any time really, if we're just spouting off and uh, throwing offhanded comments about people or just kind of you know, sharing frustration about circumstances, people, our jobs, our churches, things going on, whatever it is, anything in our lives, we think we're just kind of venting our frustrations. But in reality, if you look at what James is saying here, He says we're actually strengthening these destructive thoughts in our hearts. And over time, our thoughts are going to become actions, and our actions are going to direct our course. So Proverbs, many places in Proverbs, it talks about guarding our hearts. In Proverbs 4.23, it tells us, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So what James seems to be telling us here is that one of the best ways that we can guard our hearts is by guarding our mouths and our words, being careful what we say. So let's pause for a second, take a deep breath, because this is kind of a heavy topic, and we're all aware that life is hard, and when life is hard, we're more prone to, or maybe I'm the only one, maybe I'm I'm, I'm preaching to myself this morning, so I assure you that. When my life gets hard, I'm more prone to say things that I could probably keep tucked down in when life is going better, when the sun is shining. James seems to give us a little bit of hope here when he's like, hey, get this, if you could possibly keep a tight rein on your tongue and never be at fault in what you're saying, you would be a perfect man. You're like, oh, thanks for the hope, James. And then like a breath later, he's like, but alas, no one can do that. Actually, it's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison and you're going to fail miserably. (laughs) Thanks, James. That's your message. Go and be blessed, guys. Appreciate that, James. That does not sound promising. Tame your tongue. You can't do it. Thankfully, our hope does not lie within our own ability, within our own willpower and ability to change what we do, what we say, or our actions. Life is hard, and we're filled with sin. We're filled with sin when life is hard. We're filled with sin when life isn't hard. But here's the hope. Our God is good, and he is so good to us, even when we don't deserve it. And for that reason, we have hope. That's our second point this morning. God is good. First one, life is hard. Second one, God is good. In James chapter 1, he tells us this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. 
Now, James is no different than the rest of the Bible. The entire Bible is a story about how good our God is towards the people who do not deserve it. And James is telling us that everything that is worthy of being called good in our lives, whether we recognize it or not, everything that is truly good is a gift from our Father in heaven. And then he says to us, one of those good gifts, <laughs> the greatest gift of all, is our salvation. And if you look closely at what he's saying here in chapter 1, you notice that he's actually using two words here to describe our salvation and these words are critical for us to understand what it truly means to be a person who's been saved. What it truly means to be a person who knows, loves, and follows Jesus Christ. What are those words? He tells us first that our salvation is a gift. And second, he tells us that our salvation is a new birth. We have to remember that. He says that salvation is a gift from God, and that is important because that means, think about any gift you've ever received. There's nothing that you need to do to earn it. And the same is true of our salvation. There's nothing that we need to do. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. All we must do is turn from our sins and receive this free gift from our Father God in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2 celebrates this, saying, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Thank you, God, because if I had to work to earn it, if we had to work to earn it, we'd never get there. This is the greatest news of all, that in spite of all the sin in our hearts and in spite of every foolish word that comes out of our mouths revealing the sin in our hearts, in spite of all of that, God still reaches out to us in grace and love and offers us this amazing gift of salvation. And remember, the only condition for being made right with the Father in heaven is recognizing our need for a Savior and coming to Jesus. Jesus says he did not come for those who don't think they need his help. He came for those who recognize and are willing to admit there's no way when we leave this world and we come to stand before a holy God in heaven, there's no way that we are going to make ourselves good enough to stand before God on our own. It is to those people, it is to the humble people who recognize they need help that he offers to cleanse us of our sins and give us a new life. I have to say this, if you are here this morning, maybe you've been in church for a long time, it does not matter. Maybe for years you have tried to get your life right. You've tried to clean up your act in an effort to be good enough to then come to God. This is your good news. The word gospel means good news. This is the good news. You don't have to get yourself right and then come to God. He's ready for you to come now, just as you are, with your mistakes and your baggage, and he has this free gift for you, and it's the greatest gift you will ever receive in your life. He's not waiting for you to change yourself. When you come to God, he will change you from the inside out. It's like we were singing the first worship song this morning, like, you know, if we tarry until we're good enough, I don't remember the exact lyrics, I apologize, then we're never going to come, and that's just it. If you're waiting until you're good enough, you're going to be waiting the rest of your life. Come now. Listen to this promise from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel in chapter 36. God says to us, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. That's God's Old Testament promise of all that he's going to do for us through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on the cross and the sending of his Holy Spirit. This was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came, and this is our promise for today. Christ has come, and a new life is available for us for the receiving. This is our hope. This is our hope in life, and this is our hope to change the way that we speak. The Spirit of God living within us. He will change our desires and cause us to walk in a way that is pleasing to God. Remember, true salvation, if we look at what James says here to describe it, it's a gift and it's a new birth. True salvation and it's a holy... Look at the promise in Ezekiel. Every time you dig into salvation, you recognize that it always comes with new affections and new desires and a desire to live in a way that is pleasing to God. It's wonderful. He works within us. So now the second thing that he said about salvation, first, it's a, new, it's a gift. Second, he compares salvation to a new birth. Now, 
I'm, I'm not an expert on children. I have three young children at home. But one thing I do know about, the, the memory of newborns is fresh in my mind, I should say. One thing I do know about newborns is that they're meant to grow and mature. I do know that, if nothing else. Um, and you need to get the diapers out of the diaper room and then like somewhere else where you don't have to deal with Those two things I know. Newborns are meant to grow and mature. And the same is true in our faith. We start as a new birth and then we're meant to grow and mature and become more like Jesus Christ. That's God's will for us. He doesn't save us to just leave us on our own the rest of the time. And we grow and mature spiritually in a lot of different ways. One of the ways we're doing this morning, we gather together in corporate worship, we listen to the preaching of the word, we sing songs to our Lord and Savior, we participate in communion. These are all ways that we seek the Lord and he helps to grow us and mature us spiritually. I mean, then you do things privately on your own as well. Um, read your Bible. Uh, spend time with God in prayer on your own. Um, then there's like small groups and stuff. There's all these things that we can do, he's given us to do, to help us become more like Jesus and mature spiritually. Let me tell you how this relates back to James chapter 3 and taming our tongues. Because I could just stand up here all day and just tell us how dangerous your words are and just try and like sink that into your hearts and then tell you uh, to work hard to be careful what you say. I could do that. And here's the thing. We do need to work hard to be careful what we say. There is, some, there is truth to that. We need to work hard. And maybe one of the best ways that we can just think about taming our tongues is just like talking less, saying less things. That's just one thing we can do. But... If that's all we do is work hard on our own and just like strive to change the way we talk and like I white knuckle it, I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to do better this week. And we just try really hard and that's all we do, we're going to fail miserably. Because God never intended for us to like receive salvation and then just work really hard on our own to like change how we behave. That was not God's intention and he did not leave us on our own. Just like we were saved by God's grace, and there was nothing we could do there. In the same way, we will grow and mature spiritually only with God's help, by God's grace. So what I mean is this when we're thinking about using our words. God is just waiting to help us change in many ways, including taming our tongue. If we'll just come to him and ask him for help. He's this infinite, loving God who loved us enough to send his own son to die on a cross for us. And you don't think he wants to help you change your speech and speak in a loving manner, he does. And think about this. We're talking about spiritual maturity, becoming like Jesus. He always used his words perfectly, and that is what God wants for us. So we need to spend time with God in humble prayer, asking him for his help. Maybe think of it this way. Talk more to God, and then maybe talk a little less to man. When our words come out, and this is helpful for me, when your words come out, because we're going to walk this out, and we're going to walk with the Lord, and we're going to like ask for his help, and we're going to be working towards this, but still, we're going to fail along the way. And until the day we get to heaven, we're still going to continue to sin. The goal is growth, not we're not going to reach perfection on this side of heaven. And so when we do say things that we wish we could take back, when we do say things that are unloving and unkind, we can recognize that these words are not just words, and they are coming from our hearts. And what they're doing is, when we see them and think, man, why did I just say that? We can realize, oh, that means that there's some part of my heart that maybe I, you know, I haven't like necessarily fully surrendered to Jesus. Or maybe I've tried and you know, I just, I'm still holding on to something. Or there's just this area of sin in my life and I didn't even maybe necessarily know it was there, but now that I've seen it, I know I need God's help to change and grow in that area. Our words are revealing areas that we need God's grace to become more like Jesus. And so this means that when we're praying, we should come to God with like brutally honest prayers. If we have what you know, you either know it's there or you say something and realize it's there and you realize man, why did I say that about that person? Or why, you know, and you realize I have like hate in my heart. I have lust in my heart. I have jealousy in my heart. Guys, just come to God. Come before God humbly, honestly, and confess this to him. Talk to him. He knows we're sinners, right? It's not like I'm gonna come to him and start sharing something. He go, oh, I didn't know Tim was that messed up. Yeah, he, he knows. He knows He knows how messed up we are. We're not hiding anything from him. Turns out he's sovereign. 
This means, this is kind of good news really because this means that we can be honest with our feelings and honest with what's going on inside of us. Taming our tongue does not mean that we just have to like keep everything down and suppress everything and never like say anything that's going on in our heart. So I can't let that out. It just means that we bring these things to the Lord in prayer and ask him for his grace and help. In the book of Psalms, we see David praying and just pouring out his heart all through the, the book of Psalms is a book of prayers. Uh, and David's always coming to God with this just total honesty, uh, sharing his sin, and then in humility. I mean, this is king of Israel, guys, he was a powerful person. Uh, maybe at one time, like the most powerful person in the world. And so the humility of coming and just saying, I, I can't, I need your help. I cannot do this. Psalm 141, we see David praying. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds. That's kind of neat there. We see him praying at the same time. God, guard my mouth and guard my heart. Excuse me. So we can pray like this. We should pray like this. We need to ask God for help. He wants to help us. But here's an interesting thing that I was thinking about as I was going through this. I realized it wouldn't necessarily be true to say that we will come and pray and ask God for help and then we're going to say totally different words to other people because sometimes um, our words that we say to other people, even after we pray, those words will be the exact same words that we would have said before we prayed. Only now, after praying, we're going to say them with a different heart motivation and probably, I would expect, a different tone. So what I mean is this. In the Bible, it tells us that we are to speak the truth to other people. And so what this will include is there will be times when we will see other people walking in sin or doing something they shouldn't, that isn't pleasing to the Lord. And we need to say something about that. And that might offend or hurt them. Or maybe there will be times when somebody has done or said something that has like hurt and offended you. And you're going to need to deal with that and say something. So you need to speak the truth. But I have found in my own life that, okay, I need to speak the truth. And I just think about it. And then I start planning. And oh, here's what I'm going to say. And if they say this, I'm going to say that. And then we just come out with the truth like a club and just start beating them with it and saying, you've got to see things the way I see them, and you need to change. And, you, and really, if we think about it, well, yeah, we may be saying something that's truthful, but what's our heart motivation behind that? Is it loving? Are we really wanting them to like repent? And are we trying to like fix and restore a relationship? In theory, maybe yes, but we seem to be going about it a really not so great way. Because what we see Jesus telling us is that when we speak the truth, we've got to speak the truth in love. And so what this means is that when we come to God in this humble prayer and we're confessing things like, God, uh, you know this situation. You know what's going on. You know why I'm so upset. And I am just, and then you just, God, I, like, I'm furious at this person and I don't want anything good for them. Uh, I just wish bad things for them. But God, you're telling me to love these people. And so I need your grace. I need your spirit to help me, to work within me, to change my heart, and help me to speak words that are gracious and truthful, and help me to speak them in a loving way. And then God will work within us, and we're going to fail, it won't be perfect, but God will work within us, changing us from the inside out and giving us his love for our fellow man. And it's by his grace that we will be able to change our tone, and we'll be able to speak the truth, and do something like confront sin in someone else's life, and we'll be able to do it in a way that is loving and truthful at the same time. And then God will be at work in this situation, bringing repentance, bringing restoration, Lord willing, you know. Things don't always work out perfectly, but when God is in, you know, doing his thing, he does the God thing that we're not going to be able to do by just swinging the truth like a club. Jesus promised, Jesus promised to never leave us or forsake us. We may not be able to tame our tongues on our own, but with God's help, we can. So we shouldn't shy away from coming to God, asking him for his help. Because the truth of the matter is, God wants to help us more than we even want his help. He's just waiting right there for us to come to him. So this brings us to our final point, and I promise this is the shortest point. It's going to be brief. So our fi the second point uh, was God is good, and our final point is tell the world. Look at what James says to us in verses 9 and 10. He says, With our tongues we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who were made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, 
These things ought not to be. James is stressing for us here that all of our words must be consistent with the faith that we profess to have in Jesus in our hearts. If you look at the book of James, you see this is a consistent theme throughout is that all of our actions should flow from and be a reflection of the faith that we say we have in Jesus. Everything should flow out of that, including and especially our speech. A changed heart must be revealed in a life of changed actions. So if we claim to love God and bless him with our lips, we cannot then, in the same breath, turn around and curse our fellow man who's been made in God's likeness. In other words, the only right way to use our speech would be to use it to bless both God and bless our fellow man. Jesus himself instructs us in Luke chapter 6. He says, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. And I'll be honest with you, if I was standing there with Jesus when he said this, I'd be like, that sounds crazy, Jesus. What are you talking about? Bless those who curse me. I don't, mm, mm, I don't, how's that? Why? I would say why. Why should we do this? Why should we bless those who don't deserve it? We should do this because that is exactly what God has done for us by sending his son to live for us and die for us when we did not deserve it. When we were cursing him, he came, died for us. It says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've all received the love of God when we didn't deserve it. And we are all called to freely share that same love with the undeserving world around us. And I think really there's no better way to use our speech as a blessing than to use it to tell the world about how good our God is. If you can think of a better way to bless someone, I'm all ears. Instead of using our words to vent our, our anger and just vent our perspective and all, you know, I'm frustrated and you need to hear about it. Instead of maybe doing that so much, maybe with God's help we can use our words to tell the world of our kind and gracious king who sent his son to die for us on a cross. What a novel idea. We should tell the world of all the things that God has done for you and that he's done for me. How he brought us out of darkness and into light. Here's the thing. I mean, have you looked around lately? This world seems to be very dark and possibly getting darker. It seems to be an all-time low for hope. So I think that in the time, in this time of darkness, maybe more than ever, we have this bright light to shine the good news of the gospel and bring hope to the lost. What has God done for you and who have you told? I think... Um, got just a couple more things I'm going to say here. In light of that, I would invite the band to come back up. In James chapter 3, we read about the power that our sinful words have to spread destruction like a forest fire. It spreads. But it's interesting because in a similar fashion, Jesus tells us, he uses this metaphor of his gospel and the good news of his kingdom also having this tremendous power to start small and then spread exponentially. In Matthew 13, 33, we read, He told them still another parable. This is Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. We've been given this gospel, this good news from our Father in heaven. And Jesus is saying here, yeah, it might start small. It might even be no more than like a pinch of yeast that we spread. But the cool thing is this gospel has the power of the infinite creator God behind it. And it's going to have this effect of spreading throughout your entire body, changing your entire life, and flowing through you, and changing the people around you, and changing your family around you, and changing your community, and flowing out of our community into the world bringing reconciliation between the lost and their Father God. So I'll leave you with this. A lot of times I'm right there with you. A lot of times life is hard. But I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Our God is good. So let's tell the world. I'm going to pray and the band will come up. Father, we are so thankful for the gospel. We're so thankful that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us when we did not deserve it. And we thank you that um, no matter 
what is going on in the world around us, no matter what is going on in our own lives, we know that you are good and you are in control and you have a gospel message that you want to proclaim to the world in the midst of all circumstances. So God, I pray that you would even today uh, help us to just take our focus off of whatever maybe it has been on that is not you, Jesus, and bring our focus back into um, loving you and all that you've done for us and how that impacts our hearts. And then may we have your grace to tell that news to the world around us. I pray, Lord, even this week for opportunities for us to share the good news of all that you've done for us this week with someone who hasn't heard it yet. And may you be lifted high. We pray this in your name, Jesus. We love you so much. Amen.